Welcome to Wealth Wisdom. If you have ambitions to achieve financial success, please leave yes in the comment, and we are here to help you obtain insight and build wealth. The book we are going to share today is Success and Luck by Robert H. Frank. A new look at economic fortunes. Picture the most successful person you can imagine, a billionaire, a CEO, a captain of industry. Now consider, how did they get their success? Surely, you'd think, through hard work, dedication, and great ideas. Well, maybe, but that's not the whole story. It's entirely possible that economists, politicians, and everyday people have been underestimating the role of something else altogether, luck. In these chapters, we'll look at the role of luck in determining success, and argue that not just talent or skill, but also good fortune, may in fact be a crucial factor driving today's economy. In these chapters, you'll learn how a strong tailwind can change a race, how one ambitious engineer ruined his career, and why pianos are no longer made locally. Before we continue, if you are interested in this topic, please consider subscribing and give us a thumb up. Let's continue. Luck plays a greater role in economic success than we acknowledge. November, 2007. The author, Robert Frank, is locked in a fierce but friendly tennis match with a colleague. The two players volley back and forth when disaster strikes. Frank falls to the court in a state of acute cardiac arrest. On a normal day, it would take an ambulance several minutes to arrive at the scene, far too late to offer medical help. But, on this day, one happened to be just around the corner. It was pure luck, and that luck saved Frank's life. Of course, these strokes of fortune happen all the time, for both good and ill. Freak accidents, happy coincidences, and other twists of fate shape our lives at every turn. Importantly, they also shape our economic outcomes. The key message is, luck plays a greater role in economic success than we acknowledge. There's an enduring myth in our society that those who achieve great economic success do so through hard work, dedication, and great ideas. This is meritocracy, and it says that those who rise to the top deserve their position, power, and prestige. Meanwhile, those at the bottom also deserve their status, because they didn't try hard enough. But, there's a problem with this logic. Sure, successful people usually work hard for their riches, but consider this, for every successful person there are thousands more who are just as talented and ambitious, yet never achieve great fortune. Why? Well, partly, it's pure chance. At some point, the prosperous person got a lucky break and that helped their merit flourish into rewards. This luck can come in many forms. For instance, the circumstances you're born into are completely down to chance, but have a huge impact on your trajectory in life. A person born to wealthy parents in a developed country has a much easier time gaining money and status than an equally talented person born into harder conditions. Even talent itself is down to luck, some people are born with it, while others are given more opportunities to develop it. Either way, if you have it, you're lucky. Why is this important? In our winner-takes-all society, those with resources tend to accumulate more and more while everyone else loses out. If we keep up the myth of meritocracy, then the rewards will just keep going to a lucky few at the expense of everyone else. A magnificent career can depend on a series of lucky breaks. In the 1940s, sociologist Paul Lazarsfeld conducted an experiment on human credulity. He announced that research showed soldiers from rural areas were much better able to adjust to the rigors of military life than those from city backgrounds. No one was surprised. Obviously, country boys had that unique grit necessary for battle. But, there was a catch. Lazarsfeld's research had actually found the exact opposite, urban soldiers were better. Still, people had no trouble believing the fake results, because they'd already been led to imagine the false narrative. You see, humans tend to see any outcome as inevitable because of something called hindsight bias, and it hides the fact that in reality, events, including personal success, are often determined by chance, not destiny. The key message here is, a magnificent career can depend on a series of lucky breaks. When we see someone at the top of their profession, it usually seems obvious why they're there. 
Brian Cranston is a big star because he's a great actor, Bill Gates is a billionaire because he's a shrewd businessman, and the author, Robert Frank, is a respected economist because he has brilliant insights. But, talent aside, there are usually other factors at play, including lucky breaks. Bill Gates, for example, is undoubtedly smart. But, he also had the fortune to go to Lakeside Prep in the late 1960s. At the time, this school was one of the few places to offer students access to rudimentary computer terminals. The young Gates was one of a handful of pupils learning programming at the dawn of the digital era, a stroke of luck that set him up to become an early pioneer in computing. Even really trivial circumstances can have an impact. Take the birth months of successful CEOs. They aren't distributed evenly, with summer birthdays underrepresented by a factor of about one-third. Researchers think this gap is due to the academic calendar. Children born in June, July, and August are often the youngest kids in their class, a position that could leave them feeling less confident, which in turn keeps them from reaching leadership positions in school and may impact their achievement down the line. This isn't to say that our lives are predetermined by outside forces. Hard work and persistence are important, too. But, those who manage to reach the heights of success often benefit from circumstance as well, and as the next chapters show, one lucky break can lead to another. A little luck can compound into an unbeatable advantage. Imagine it's the 18th century and you want to buy a piano. You'd probably go to the nearest manufacturer. Why? Well, pianos are big and cumbersome. Moving one any distance would be difficult, so you stay local. As a result, the economy grows to support many small piano makers, each covering a particular area. Enter trains, cars, and shipping containers, and now, local sellers must compete with piano makers all over the world. People only buy from the best, so a few outstanding companies soak up all the business and the rest go bankrupt. It's a classic example of winner takes all. What determines the winner? Yes, skill and talent. But, if one factory has access to the finest, most resonant wood, that's a bit of luck that might just give them the edge. The key message here is, a little luck can compound into an unbeatable advantage. Some economists argue that a person's income is determined by their human capital, their skills, education, intelligence, and other individual characteristics. These assets determine how much value that person has in the job market. But, this isn't strictly true. After all, today's highest earners rake in magnitudes more money than previous generations, yet the jump doesn't match a huge increase in raw ability. Instead, today's inequality can be partially explained by improved technologies and expanding markets. Digital communication and worldwide logistics operations allow companies to compete everywhere. Any company with the slightest edge will eventually dominate, making huge profits. And those profits translate to absurdly high salaries for CEOs and other high-status people. Importantly, the slight edge that determines success is often up to chance. With millions of businesses and business people competing against each other, many of them have the right qualities to succeed. So, to stand out you need some luck. With so many competitors in the field, chances are one of them will experience a one-in-a-million spell of good fortune and that's all it takes to elevate them beyond the others. Think of it like high-level athletes in a race. On any given day, each runner has a pretty good chance of finishing with the best time. But, if one happens to catch an unexpected and uncharacteristically strong tailwind, she could finish a few milliseconds faster, just enough to win. In a winner-take-all economy, that one win compounds over time into complete domination. People have trouble seeing where luck has been on their side. Here's a fun experiment, ask any driver how they rate their driving ability. Chances are, they'll mark themselves quite highly. In fact, 90% of drivers report that their skills on the road are above average. Obviously, this is statistically impossible. Mathematically speaking, at least half of all people must be below average. That's just how averages work. Yet, this self-congratulatory pattern emerges again and again. Most teachers think they're above average teachers and most students assume they're above average pupils. Clearly, people don't always perceive the world accurately. 
This is especially true when it comes to acknowledging the role of luck in success. The key message here is, people have trouble seeing where luck has been on their side. By now, it should be apparent that luck plays a pivotal role in people's professional or monetary success. But, when asked to list the factors they think have led to their accomplishments, most people shy away from crediting pure chance. Instead, they emphasize the elements within their control, like their work ethic or business sense. Even lottery winners talk about their brilliant strategies for picking numbers. One reason for this hesitancy may be something called the availability heuristic. This cognitive bias, or mental shortcut, is the tendency for people to overemphasize things that they remember easily. For example, when you reflect on your career, you're more likely to remember the painful or difficult moments that led you to achieve your goal. Memories of all-night work sessions are more mentally available, so you give them greater importance when thinking about the reasons for your success. In some cases, this bias can actually be helpful. Consider a student hoping to attend a prestigious university. With so many talented peers applying for the same spots, luck will be a deciding factor in who actually gets accepted. Now, if the student truly believes luck will play a role, they might have trouble putting in the work. If one bad break will keep them from their dream, why put in endless hours of studying? Still, underplaying the role of luck has its downsides, especially when it comes to larger societal issues. It can make people less sympathetic to those struggling with a bad hand in life and give the lucky few undue confidence in their abilities. We'll look at this more closely in the next chapter. To keep our society lucky, we must spread the rewards of good fortune. Meet Berkman Rai. Berkman lives in the rural outskirts of Nepal. He's friendly, smart, and full of ingenuity. On any given day he can cook an elaborate meal, repair complex equipment, or successfully bargain with local merchants. Despite his ample skill, Berkman will never make more than the average Nepalese income of $1,500 a year. Yet, if he'd been born in a rich, developed nation like the United States, he would likely reap much higher financial rewards as a celebrated chef, mechanical engineer, or Wall Street power broker. Berkman's fortune depends on the circumstances of his birth. But, just because the US is currently a lucky place to be born, doesn't mean it's going to stay that way. The key message here is, to keep our society lucky, we must spread the rewards of good fortune. When it comes to achieving economic prosperity, being born in a wealthy nation is extremely lucky. Countries like the US offer the infrastructure, education system, and robust job market that make building a successful career much more likely. If we can maintain these common goods, more people will benefit from the opportunities that come from this charmed environment. Unfortunately, we're doing just the opposite. Over the last decades, the US has failed to invest in the things that make it lucky. According to the American Society of Civil Engineers, the country's roads, bridges, and sewers are in dire condition. Its public school systems are extremely underfunded and 70% of college students have massive debt. Even the rail network pales in comparison with poorer nations. Much of this disinvestment is driven by bad economic policies. The US government doesn't spend money on important goods because it doesn't take in enough tax revenue. For instance, Bush-era tax cuts reduced federal revenue by a whopping $2.9 trillion. It's a trend that could easily be reversed by raising taxes on the wealthiest and luckiest members of our society, using their good fortune to ensure more people have the same blessings. But, the rich balk at this idea. Because we underplay the role of luck in building wealth, many rich people think their success is entirely personal. They view any attempt to spread the bounty as unjust. Still, if we can change how we think of success, and show that much of it depends on external blessings, we could make the idea of higher taxes for public goods more acceptable. A consumption tax can moderate spending and fund collective goods. How much do you think it costs to throw a special, memorable wedding celebration? The truth is, it all depends on context. In 1980, the average American wedding cost $11,000. In 2014, a typical wedding clocked in at $30,000. In Manhattan, that figure is more than $76,000, while in a rural village somewhere like Appalachia, 
it's probably much, much less. Either way, the amount of money you drop on a wedding doesn't actually matter, as long as you are spending roughly in line with what others spend. Everyone spending more doesn't make the event more meaningful or the marriage happier. At some point, you're just spending to spend. It's wasteful, especially since that excess cash could be invested in ways that produce lasting value. The key message is, a consumption tax could moderate spending and fund collective goods. In economics, there are always trade-offs. When you spend money on one thing, you don't have that money for another. Currently, our society's spending habits are tilted toward personal consumption rather than collective goods. This is especially true of the super-rich who have lots of excess capital, although the same behavior flows down to the less wealthy as well. This pattern happens because consumption habits are relative. As wealth concentrates, the luckiest buy more extravagant goods, which sparks competition. Suddenly, what was once an excellent house, wedding, or car seems inadequate. Yet, the actual utility of these goods doesn't increase, just the cost. It's a bit like an arms race between nations, each spends more on weapons, yet neither actually becomes safer. It's in everyone's best interests to cool down our spending habits. A possible way to do this is a progressive consumption tax. Under this scheme, people would be taxed according to how much they spend on goods after saving and investing. So, a family earning $100,000 and saving $20,000 a year would have $80,000 subject to a modest tax. To account for the rich, this rate would increase as consumption rose. In theory, this policy would have two effects. First, it would reduce the amount people waste keeping up with the Joneses, without negatively affecting saving and investment rates or overall quality of life. Second, because people would still buy things, and some would still buy a lot, it would raise tax revenue which could be spent on common goods like infrastructure, healthcare, and education. Not a bad plan. A little humility and a lot of collaboration are crucial to getting ahead. Scott Forstall had all the right skills for a magnificent career. As Apple's senior vice president, he was noted for creating the iOS operating system that helped make the iPhone and iPad must-have tech items. Many assumed he would be the company's next CEO. But, in 2012, he was fired. The problem was that Forstall was ambitious and arrogant. According to colleagues, he only looked after himself. He took sole credit when major collaborative projects succeeded and deflected blame onto others when projects failed. In the end, Forstall's engineering prowess couldn't overcome his negative qualities. It seems that individual success is easier when you acknowledge the work of others. The key message here is, a little humility and a lot of collaboration are crucial to getting ahead. People are very self-interested. In economics, this vision of humanity is sometimes called homo economicus. Homo economicus will always make rational decisions based on what will help him the most. For instance, if gas prices go up, we can expect saving savvy homo economicus to heat his home less and buy a fuel-efficient car. Now, it may seem like the best, most rational way to get ahead in life is to always promote yourself and your accomplishments. But, it turns out that this isn't strictly the case. Most success comes from working in teams, and people don't want narcissists as teammates. Instead, they want people who can collaborate, share successes, and see the bigger picture beyond their own input. To test this, the author ran an experiment. He split his students into two groups. Each group read one of two profiles of a fictional businessman named Harold Johnson. Both profiles chronicled Johnson's admirable career and personal life, yet they differed in one key respect. In the first profile, Johnson credits his success to his own skills, while in the other, he speaks of his lucky breaks and the contributions of others. Unsurprisingly, the students liked the second Johnson best. They ranked him higher on scales of kindness and trustworthiness and were much more likely to hire him as a business partner. A bit of humility and self-awareness shouldn't be underestimated. If you're fortunate enough to succeed in life, remember, it's in your best interests to celebrate the many chance events and lucky breaks that helped you along the way. That's the end of today's sharing. If you like our content, 
please give us a thumb up and share it with your friends. See you next time.